uh, and, and I mean, I'm not really through killing yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a three-day hike up the coast, and I'm going to go to the city of Ammonihah, and I'm just going to kill them. So they do. And it's the only time in the Book of Mormon where we see them bringing back captives. Every other time, when the Lamanites go out to conquer a city, they go out to conquer a city, and they put them under uh, a tribute status so that they can get the money back. In this case, they don't even do that. They don't bother. They just go out, kill a few people, grab some captives, and head back home. Because they, I guess, still wanted to kill people. So then they get home, and the anti-Nephi-Lehi say, this is probably a clue that we should get out of here. So they leave, and they go to Zarahemla, and they show up in Zarahemla, and the people in Zarahemla said, welcome, we'll give you a land over here by the people of Gideon. You can farm it, and we'll put you in a safe place, because we know you're not going to fight anymore. Uh, and now that you're in a safe place, we can protect you. Unfortunately, that safe place was really by the Zoramites. And the Zoramites turned, and all of a sudden, these guys are in trouble again. And there's a huge war that's being fought on two different fronts, and the Nephites are really in trouble now. And the people of anti-Nephi-Lehi say, oh, man, you know, you guys need help. We, we actually know how to fight, so maybe we should do that. But, boy, if we do that, we could lose our souls. And we won't do that. We're not going to do that. We're not going to fight. But we've got a great idea. Let's have our 12- and 14-year-old sons go out and do it for us. Let's take the deacons. <laughs> and we'll take the deacons and we'll give them a shield and a sword and we'll say, you guys go fight. I'm going to stay here and farm. How's that? This is weird. How does this happen? How in the world do you ever get pacifist parents who think it's a great idea to send 12- and 14-year-old sons off to war? It doesn't make sense. Now, let me drop it into Mesoamerican culture and give you some background on what's happening here. They say that they are murderers. Every single one of them. The anti-Nephi-Lehites say we have been murderers. Now, when would the children have murdered anyone? When would the women have murdered anyone? Even the warriors, if you're fighting in battle, every human population manages to define war in such a way that we're not murdering anyone. You know, we're killing an enemy or doing something else. That isn't murder. They deserved it after all. So it can't be explained by warfare. It's something else. If it is, as I suspect, human sacrifice, they're saying we had to give up a religion that was focused on human sacrifice. Human sacrifice came through warfare. And in Mesoamerica, warfare was intimately connected with the, pra the practice of human sacrifice. So they're saying that when we changed religions, we had to get rid of all of the things that led us to the ancient religion, including anything that would make us have the feelings that we felt when we were in a position where we wanted to sacrifice a human being. And like an alcohol alcoholic making sure they abstain from drink, they said, if we don't fight, well, we won't have those feelings and we won't be destroying our souls because we're doing that. Why do they bury the weapons? You know, if I bury a million dollars in my backyard and all of a sudden the stock market crashes, not that it would, but if it did, I think I'd go dig it up. And if they bury these things, why don't they dig it up? First of all, why do you bury it in the first place? Okay. Well, it turns out that there's a Mesoamerican tradition of cashing goods that you give to the gods. And when you make a commitment to the gods, you will bury the offering in the earth. And what it doesn't say, and again you'll remember that they don't always tell you everything because they assume you know, most of the times when you cashed an object in Mesoamerica, you broke it first. So they broke the weapons and buried them. Why didn't they dig them up? They were broken. They were not things that you could go get again because you had symbolically broken them to witness that you were giving them over to God. So that's why they buried them. By the way, it has nothing to do with burying the hatchet. For those people who think that it's related to the tomahawk and burying the hatchet, no relationship whatsoever. Okay, the Lamanites come in and they start killing people. The real clue to the story here is that they're trying to become kings. And when you are trying to become the king, there is a tradition in Maya culture of how you become a king. And one of the things that you must do in order to become a king, in order to be seated as the king, 
is you must sacrifice people who have been captured in combat. Guess what didn't happen with the anti-Nephi Lehi's? They didn't fight back. So they couldn't be the captives that would seat the king. So when they finish killing them and they say, oh, I still want to kill somebody else, it wasn't because they wanted to kill somebody. They need captives in battle. They didn't have any. They're trying to seat a new king and they needed captives. And they did what every Mesoamerican king did. They went to some unsuspecting town that doesn't know that they're coming, raid the darn thing so that you know, they get an easy battle take the captives and bring them back. Why is it that this is the only time in the Book of Mormon that they're bringing captives back? Because they need them to seat the king. Why is it that the people said, I cannot fight, but my sons can? Because the sons had not ever participated in that culture. They took the ones who were young enough that they had never been part of that religion. They would be able to fight with a pure heart and not think of the other religion. They could do it, the parents could not. So for that reason, the parents said, we can send our sons and we can't go. So if we take this context and we drop the story into the context of that area of the world, it starts to make sense in ways that it cannot make sense if we look at it dispassionately as an historian. And the rest of the Book of Mormon is working that same way. When you find the correct context in the correct culture, it automatically becomes the missing context that they don't tell you about. And it becomes productive in that it begins to tell you things that you would not otherwise have known. The one thing that it cannot do is it cannot tell us the one thing that we have already known, which is that the Book of Mormon is true. Even with all of this information, the Book of Mormon was true before we learned it. The Book of Mormon is true now. The difference is not that the Book of Mormon is or is not true, but if we can read it against a cultural context, we can appreciate those people better. We can understand them better as real human beings. We can understand their motivations. We can understand why they did things. And by understanding those things, Perhaps then we can understand a little bit better how to apply those same things to our own lives. I bear you my testimony that I know that the Book of Mormon is true. I absolutely love the text. I, I love finding out some of the other things that are going on behind it. But above and beyond, beyond everything else, it's true because the Holy Ghost says that it's true. There isn't anything that any scholar is going to tell you that could possibly make it any truer than what the Holy Ghost will witness to you. I bear you that witness in Jesus' name. Amen. I get to stay here.